These last few videos are going to close the last gap that we have before you're ready to take calculus. And that is to let, take a look at what is called sigma notation as we evaluate and find things related to sequences and series. So we're going to set this up today with the question simply, what is a sequence? And in layman's terms, a sequence is just going to be an ordered list of numbers. Usually, there's some type of pattern to that ordered list, but there doesn't have to be. But when there's a pattern to that list of numbers, we become particularly interested in working with them. One way we can identify this pattern is using what is called a recursive definition. And the recursive definition defines the first term And let's say we're using the letter a to represent our terms. So we're going to use a subscript of 1 to represent the first term, the first a. Then we're also going to define how each term relates to the previous term. So for example, I could define the first term is 5. Then for any nth term, actually, let's label that. Each term, we're going to call that a sub n. So the nth term, a sub n, is equal to the previous term. Well, the previous term is going to have a subscript that's 1 less than the current term. So I'll call that n minus 1 plus 2. And so this defines the first term is 5. And then every term after that says, grab the previous term and add 2 to it. So my first term, a sub 1, we know is 5. My second term, a sub 2, says, grab the previous term, which is 5, and add 2 to it which gives me 7 for the second term. a sub 3 would be the third term. The third term says grab the previous term, which was 7, and add 2 to it. Gives me 9. And we can keep going. And in fact, we usually will list out the numbers in a sequence as inside brackets, maybe 5, 7, 9, the next one you can see would be 11, then 13, and so on. That is the sequence of terms defined by this recursive formula. However, recursive formulas are sometimes inconvenient to work with because if we wanted to find the 30th term, we would have to list out all 30 terms adding to the previous term or doing whatever operation the a sub n equation said. So we've got a second way that we like to refer to sequences. And that's with what's called the explicit formula. The explicit formula defines each term with a formula. based on position. And the position, so if each term is going to be your a sub n, represent the nth term, the position then is just the n or whatever term number we're on. So for example, I might see an explicit formula like a sub n equals 3 times 2 to the n power. And now we can say, well, gee, a sub 1, the first term, is 3 times 2 to the n, which is the first power. 
And that gives me 6 for the first term. The second term, then, we just use the explicit formula. 3 times 2 to the, this is the second term, we'll do the second power. 2 squared is 4. 4 times 3 is 12. And then the third term would be 3 times 2 to the third power, which is 27 times, I'm sorry, 8 times 3, which is 24. And so you can kind of see each term is ultimately being multiplied by 2. And so we could list these out as 6, 12, 24. The next one's going to be 48, and so on. But where this really becomes valuable is now I actually have a way to find the a sub 10th term. Instead of having to go back and recalculate 10 terms, we could just do 3 times 2 to the 10th. And that'll get me directly to the answer that I'm looking for. And in this case, it gets remarkably big, remarkably fast. When I do that on my calculator, 3 times 2 to the 10th power, we're already at 3,072. But because I had an explicit formula, I was able to get at the 10th term directly without having to go back through all the terms before it. That's the advantage of the explicit formula. OK, so so far we've talked about what sequences are and how we can define them recursively or explicitly. We're going to take a brief aside to talk about factorials. And then we'll come back and bring it all together. A factorial is written as some number with an exclamation mark after it. That's read a factorial. And what that means we're going to do is we're going to take a and multiply it by 1 less than a and multiply it by 1 less than that and keep multiplying all the way down times 3 times 2 times 1. Basically, we're going to multiply by everything beneath that number. So for example, 4 factorial would be 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 24. What we need to be able to do for our purposes today is look at how we can simplify factorials. For example, we're going to see expressions such as 53 factorial divided by 51 factorial. And this we can actually simplify quite quickly and nicely using a nice slick trick where we're going to count down from the largest number to the smallest number. Here's what I mean by that. 53 is my larger number here in this example. So I'm going to count down 53 times 52 times 51, which matches the smaller number. And so that's going to be 51 factorial. What's nice about that is the 51 factorials can divide out now. And I'm just left with 53 times 52. And on my calculator really fast, I can see that's 2,756. We could even do this strategy more abstractly. If I have 5n plus 3 factorial, and I want to divide by 5n factorial, the bigger one is the one with the plus 3 on it. So we'll count down from that one. 5n plus 3 times 5n plus 2 times 5n plus 1 times 5n plus 0, which matches the bottom. And once it matches the bottom, I stop, because now those 5n factorials can divide out. And I'm just left with the expression 5n plus 3, 5n plus 2, 5n plus 1. And it's probably not worth multiplying out, so let's leave it just like that. 
Okay, that was a brief aside about factorials. They're going to come up in just a minute as we go back to talking about our sequences. As we are trying to find explicit formulas for a sequence. For example, if I have the sequence 5, 13, 21, 29, 37, and so on and so on. And I want to find the explicit formula for this sequence. We need to start looking for patterns to see how we're changing from one number to the next. What might be happening? And this is really a big guess and check. Look for patterns, uh, attack strategy. Looking at how we go from 5 to 13, I notice we add 8. Is that pattern consistent? Sure enough, if I keep going, I keep adding 8. And so that might make me think, OK, maybe I'm taking 8 times the term number. But if I let n equal 1, because n equals 1 is the first term, I get 8 times 1 equals 8 not 5 like I was expecting. So first we tried 8n. Maybe now I can try, instead of just 8n, what if I move the 8 down to 5 by subtracting 3? Now I'm going to let n equal. We know it's going to work with 1. Let's try 2. That's going to give me. 8 times 2 minus 3 is 16 minus 3, which is 13. And notice the second term is 13 like we expected. So I'm feeling pretty good about my formula. I could try n equals 3 just to make sure 8 times 3 is 24 minus 3 is 21. So I'm feeling pretty optimistic that my nth term, a sub n, is equal to 8n minus 3. And we got that simply by looking for a pattern. Let's try another sequence. Let's try 1 fourth, 8 sixteenths, 27 over 64, 64 over 256. We're going to find the explicit formula for the sequence. With fractions, sometimes it's easier to separate the numerator from the denominator. So let's first look at the numerators to see if we can identify a pattern as to what's happening. So the numerators are 1, 8, 27, 64. And I might first try and say, well, to go from 1 to 8, we might add 7. Or we might multiply by 8. But to go from 8 to 27, there we're adding 19. Huh. That's not the same. We're definitely not multiplying by 8. So we need a different strategy here. You might recognize that 1, 8, 27, and 64 look like familiar numbers. Those numbers are the cubes, 1 cubed, 2 cubed, 3 cubed, and 4 cubed. So you might assume the next one's going to be 5 cubed, 6 cubed, and 7 cubed. And so it seems that as this pattern continues, the numerator is just the term number cubed. Because when n equals 1, it was 1 cubed. When n equals 2, 2 cubed was 8. When n equals 3, 3 cubed was 27. So it seems my numerator is n cubed. My denominator is 4, 16, 64, 256. Those are all perfect squares, but they're not quite all in order. So let's go back to our old strategy. To go from 4 to 16, we could add 12. The other thing we could do is multiply by 4. 
Going from 16 to 64 is definitely not adding 12. But I do see it's multiplying by 4. And every time to get to the next term, I have to multiply by 4. So let's try repeated multiplication would be 4 raised to an exponent. Let's try n equals 2. Let's check the second term. Is that going to give us 16? 4 squared equals 16. It does. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. I'm going to say then my denominator is probably 4 to the n, which means together the nth term in the numerator is n cubed, and in the denominator is 4 to the n. And now we have an explicit formula for the sequence. Let's do one last example. Let's try 5, 10, 30, 120. To go from 5 to 10, I see that we either added 5 or we might have multiplied by 2. How do we go from 10 to 30? Well, we'd add 20, or we could multiply by 3. That's not consistent. Or is it? What happens to go to 120? We either added 90, or we multiplied by 4. The adding, I don't see any pattern with. But what do you notice about the multiplying? times 2, times 3, times 4. That almost looks like a factorial. I might try n factorial. And if I let n equal 2, then I have 2 factorial, which is 2 times 1, which is 2. Well, n equals 2 is 10. So I need to adjust my formula to get me up to 10. Let's try maybe adding 8, n factorial plus 8. Well, then let's let n equal 3. Hopefully, that'll give us the 30. So we'd have 3 factorial plus 8, which is 3 times 2 times 1 plus 8. 6 plus 8 is 14. That didn't work. Let's try something else, though. That went backwards. Instead of adding 8 to get the 10 that we wanted, what if I multiplied by 5? 5 times n factorial. Now let's let n equals 3 and see what happens. That means we've got 5 times 3 factorial, 5 times 3 times 2, 6 times 5 is? 30. That's the 30 we wanted. You could try 4 as well. And you get 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 times 5, which is 120. And so by continuing to play with options and adjusting our strategy, we end up with a sub n is equal to 5 times n factorial. Identifying these explicit formulas for sequences does take a little bit of practice with pattern recognition, because no two problems are really the same. It's really an educated guess and check method to see if we can identify how we're moving from one term to the next, and how can that help us build the explicit formula. So now it's your turn to practice with these. Take a look at the homework, and let me know if you have any questions.